With training camp less than three weeks away, how many true position battles will we really see? That plus more on Tuesday's edition of the Locked On Raiders podcast, July 2nd, 2024. You are Locked On Raiders, your daily Las Vegas Raiders podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And welcome in Raider Nation to another edition of the Locked On Raiders podcast. Thank you so much for making the show your first listen of the day. Make sure you subscribe or follow for free on YouTube or wherever you get your podcast to get the latest edition of the show as soon as it becomes available. As always, if you're giving us a look on YouTube, you know we appreciate that. Uh, the show has grown each and every day, each and every year, and that's because of the support of Raider Nation and because of my man Ari who does a great job each and every day making sure we're on YouTube, we're looking good, we're sounding good. We definitely shout him out. He's on Twitter. At Ari Produces, you can hit him up. You can hit me up as well at your boy Q254. And we got the Lockdown Raider Podcast voicemail line 707 654 4693. We will get back to calls and texts coming up on today's show. We didn't have any on Monday's show, and I didn't even celebrate the first of the month. I didn't even celebrate the hood holiday. It was my first day back from vacation, and I just kind of let the hood holiday slide on by. So it ain't the first of the month no more, but you still had to wake up, wake up, wake up, and celebrate the first of the month yesterday <laughs> so we didn't have any calls and texts we'll get back to uh we'll get back to that today in segment number three of today's show segment number two we'll talk about training camp what's coming up in costa mesa california and how many real training camp position battles are we really in for i got my idea you can share your idea that's coming up segment number two here in segment number one always like to give you the news and notes of the day as i collect it is whatever i can come up with i like to bring to the table and we'll do that here in segment number one We'll get right to it after I tell you about the title sponsor of the show, which is FanDuel. Make every moment more. As the playoffs and the finals, they wound down, well, so does sports stop. They stop sporting like we want them to, right? But this summer, FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a boost or a bonus daily. That's right. There's something for everyone every day, all summer long. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. I'll tell you about them later on in the show but again training camp starts on the 23rd the veterans report then to costa mesa the rookies on the 21st looking forward to that and uh, again like i mentioned we'll talk about the camp battles coming up in segment number two but a few pieces of news and note a little bit of audio i want you to hear as well former head coach of the silver and black john gruden and I hate that it's always stuff that's off the court or off the field that's going on uh, at this time of the year. But when it's early July, before training camp, when the mandatory mini camp is over and then training camp is, is not for a few weeks away, it's always a lot of stuff off the field. Sometimes it's contract related. Sometimes it's court related. Well, when it comes to former head coach John Gruden, it's definitely court related. He was denied a hearing in front of the full Nevada Supreme Court earlier on Monday. He had his attempts to revive his lawsuit against the NFL over the leaked emails that led to his resignation. Uh, they weren't, uh, they, they, they were denied. He has until July 29th to file a petition for reconsideration. So it's not over just yet. A three judge panel sided with the NFL in May in a 2 1 decision. The majority ruled that a Clark County judge erred when she ruled Gruden wasn't subject to NFL arbitration system that's from front office sports aj perez as a matter of fact gonna have aj perez this afternoon on my radio show unnecessary roughness on radio nation radio 920 again don't want to deep dive too much into this situation but would like to know well what's next right if he gets his petition denied once but it's not over and he can still file another petition up till july 29th okay so what what are the next steps so i want to get a little bit of clarity of that so aj perez from front office sports will actually join my radio show at 2 30 to give me a little bit of clarity if he says something really good i'll bring it to the podcast coming up on Wednesday, but just a little update on what's going again off the field stuff with former head coach John Gruden and his leaked emails. And that's always going to be something that's going to run with them, right? No matter what happens, no matter what the courts say, that's always going to be a conversation that's going to be had that the guy had a 10 year, hundred million dollar contract that he ultimately, you know, had to walk away from because of the situation he did and uh, created on his own, his own fault when he wasn't the coach of the silver and black on a, Better, more pleasant side of things when it comes to the Raiders. Talked about Max Crosby and the sack summit that took place over the weekend. Von Miller uh, and others, you know, obviously Von Miller has been hosting that camp for a long time. Now Max Crosby, uh, Cam Jordan from the Saints is also a host of it as well. 
There was a lot of uh, folks that were in attendance uh, as I got more reports and more confirmation from guys like Tashawn Reed from The Athletic who were in attendance of the event. It was a lot of different players. That This SAC Summit is really growing and growing and growing up to about 60 players in attendance. Not only were they on the field doing work, but they were in the film room uh, doing a little bit of film study and then even – uh, you know, like uh, literacy when it comes to financial literacy, uh, they got that kind of training as well. So you could t- see that this thing continues to grow and grow and grow. And it's funny, I only saw pictures. I wasn't in attendance, so I only saw pictures in video. And it looked like Tyree Wilson was a monster. But as I talked to Tashawn Reed on Monday on my radio show, he let it be known that he, he wasn't really that much bigger than what we saw at mandatory minicamp. It just appeared in some of those pictures that he was. I later saw some videos that the Raiders put out from that SAC Summit, and Tyree didn't look much bigger. It just the first couple pictures that I saw, again, I wasn't there because I was coming back from vacation. I was still flying back, traveling back from Hawaii, so I didn't get to be in attendance like I was last year. But he wasn't much bigger than the than, than what we saw at mandatory minicamp. So they made me feel a little bit better. But I thought this was an interesting statement. It's not the first time I heard Max Crosby say this and express this when it comes to being very aggressive to start games and really to mess with offensive linemen's head. Instead of playing checkers, you got to play chess. Here's Max Crosby explaining to the other guys at the SAC Summit exactly what you got to do to offensive linemen when you start the game off fast and aggressive. You talk about chess and checkers, we want to be playing chess. Old linemen, all they want to do is just get comfortable and get to their spot. Congrats. Once you get them <laughs> uncomfortable and doing doing <laughs> and reacting to you, then they're all out of whack, bro. So you got to start. That's what's so important, starting the game fast and getting into your groove and finding your rhythm right early in the game and setting up your plan because once you get it going and now they're thinking, you got a whole game to just go to work on them. So there is Max Crosby, uh, just one of the guys that was uh, obviously speaking, and this event has grown to be bigger and bigger and bigger. Vaughn Miller is at the end of his career. Cam Jordan's going to be at the end of his career sooner rather than later. Max Crosby's still a young dude, 27 years old, and so you can see that he's got the respect of not only Raider Nation, not only players on the silver and black, but players across the league. He's really embraced the you know the the role of a premier pass rusher in the uh, in the league and, and it's funny I always look at Pro Football Focus I always get these emails and you know right now this time of year it's about a lot of lists right well how good are the Raiders offensive line how good is the Raiders defensive line where do they rank in the top ten where does their quarterback situation their running back like this is the time of year right at the early July right before training camp obviously there's a few weeks and. To create content, there's always lists that are out there. Well, the Raiders' defensive line, according to Pro Football Focus, was ranked ninth. And, you know, look, I I respect the teams that they had ahead of them. I'm not going to go through all of them. But, man, when you have Max Crosby, Christian Wilkins, you saw what Malcolm Coons, forget Tyree Wilson. Like, I think he's going to be a great bonus this upcoming year. But just between Coons, Crosby, and Wilkins, like, how can they be ranked ninth? I, I don't get it. But it's okay. Right, that's for pro football focus to rank them at that spot. All they got to do is go out there and prove them wrong. But love what Max Crosby's doing and how he's continuing to grow the game and continuing to grow the sack summit that took place at UNLV on Saturday this past weekend. The final sound bite that I want you to hear here in segment number one of today's Locked On Raiders podcast, little news and notes of the day. And it's funny, we'll talk about this coming up in segment number two, and I talked about it uh, quite a bit on my radio show on Monday. Uh, My first show back was really about uh, the competitions, and we know that there's going to be a quarterback competition when training camp comes up. That's the big elephant in the room. Well, Jeremy Fowler from ESPN was on SportsCenter with uh, Matt Berry, and they actually were talking about not a great detail, only about a minute, minute 15 seconds, about the Raiders quarterback competition between Aiden O'Connell and Gardner Minshew. Check it out. Yeah. He is there, Gardner Minshew, an offseason acquisition. We thought maybe the Raiders would draft the quarterback. They did not. Yeah. These are their two guys going forward. What's the latest on that battle between Minshew and Aiden O'Connell? Yeah, so those two went back and forth in the spring. My sense is that O'Connell will have a slight edge going into training camp because year two he's been more vocal. Mm-hmm. He's acting like a starter. He's got the stamp of approval from Devontae Adams, who loves him. That always helps a little bit when you've got your top pass catcher has your back. I've told Gardner Minshew has also made quite the impression, showed a lot of moxie. He's going off script. He's changing plays in the huddle already. He's learning the offense that quickly. And so it could very well be a situation in July and August where they split preseason games. Right. O'Connell starts the first one. Maybe Minshew starts the second or they flip-flop. But that very well could be the scenario. This is a true battle. This will play out. We don't see a lot of these in training camps most of the time. It's usually rubber stamped. But this one will be pretty open, it looks like. O'Connell has made a good start, though. And by the way, every time Minshew's had an opportunity somewhere, he's played well. 
And you can't take that out of the equation. He's got the best job in the league. He can start games for you. He can be a backup. He's got a great personality. Like yeah. Minshew Magic, who doesn't want to buy? This is a big throwback show today. Raiders haven't won a playoff game since 2002. That's not Ron good. Gruden, that's a long time. Yeah. Jeremy Fowler, thank you. So that's going to be the number one competition. That's why I saved that soundbite for last, because obviously we're going to transition in segment number two into how many camp battles, how many position battles do I really see? There is definitely one between O'Connell and Minshew. There's no doubt. I believe that that's O'Connell's job to lose. I think he's the leader in the clubhouse. I'll get more into details about that coming up in segment number two. But uh, you hear what, you know, Jeremy Fowler had to say right there. He also felt like O'Connell is slightly ahead of Minshew, but he said Minshew was turning a little bit of heads. I'm not sure exactly who said that or who saw what, what heads he was turning. Obviously, I was not around the team every single day during, you know, OTAs and mandatory minicamp. I mean, we were there for the three days of, of practice out on the grass for mandatory minicamp, but we weren't there for every single practice at OTAs. So maybe he was turning heads. Maybe there are folks in the organization saying that Minshew is right up there. But from what I saw, it looked like O'Connell was ahead. It wasn't by a lot, but it looked like O'Connell was the leader in the clubhouse. So that's what I got for you for seven number one of today's Locked On Raiders podcast, little news and notes of the day. We will deep dive into the training camp position battles as camp is about three weeks away in Costa Mesa, California. We'll do that next in segment number two of today's Locked On Raiders podcast. Before we do get into that, though, I do want to let you know that today's edition of the Lockdown Raiders podcast is being brought to you in part by BetterHelp. And as many of you know, I just got back from a very much needed mind clearing and calming vacation. Uh, I had really nothing to think about except for what the next activity was going to be, where we were going to do it, what time do I need to be ready by, and what we were going to go eat afterwards. <laughs> really, it gave me a chance to reset. And everyone doesn't always have that opportunity to make a reset like that in their life. Sometimes you've got those life-changing decisions. They need to be made immediately. That's where our good friends at BetterHelp can come into play. They offer opportunities at therapy that best fits you entirely online, convenient, and able to be flexible to fit your schedule. You fill out a quick questionnaire. It's that simple. You get matched up with a licensed therapist, and if need be, you switch the therapist at any time with no additional charge. Talk with someone with no agenda on your life. Stop comparing. Start focusing with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash locked on today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, better H E L P.com slash locked on. All right, Raider Nation, here we go. Segment number two of today's Locked On Raiders podcast. Want to get into training camp position battles, right? Training camp is a little less than three weeks away. The veterans will report on 23rd with the rookies getting there a couple days earlier on July 21st. Costa Mesa, California. Looking forward to that. It's going to be really fun and be able to bring you some great coverage, you know, wall-to-wall coverage of everything that goes on in the Raiders putting together their 53-man roster, which had me thinking of... How much of that 53-man roster really, truly needs to be put together? And it's funny, as I think about it and think about the Raiders and kind of go through my mind and position by position group, it's not really a whole lot. A lot of times we talk about, man, there's going to be a battle here. It's going to be a battle here. Man, this guy's going to be working his tail off and pushing this guy. But when you really think about it and think about the Raiders team and what they have, they don't really have a lot of question marks. I feel like a lot of the positions are, are already in place. Now, obviously, as we've mentioned, and we've talked about it till we're blue in the face, the quarterback position is going to be the biggest position, right? And maybe that's why it feels like there's going to be more position battles. But to me, there's not a whole lot. The quarterback is the big elephant in the room. Aiden O'Connell, Gardner Minshew, I've let it be known many times. I think that's advantage O'Connell. I think that AP trusts him. I feel like the players on the team that were there last year with them, the guys that matter, the Devontae Adams, the Jacoby Myers, the Michael Mayer, right? Even the offensive line that was there working with them, they already know him. Uh, the running backs that already know him, guys on defense that know him and respect him already, I feel like that they, they already trust him. Gardner Minshew is not a guy that's going to back down to a challenge. He's not a guy that's going to just say, oh, well, it's your job because everybody likes you. He's going to go out there and get it and at least try to get it. And look, the players there, I, I know firsthand, like him as well. I just feel like with that, and I've said it so many times on this show, with that relationship that O'Connell had with AP, 
he's got to be the leader in the clubhouse for that. So put that aside. We'll just put that quarterback competition. We'll say, may the best man win in Costa Mesa. Regardless if you think it's going to be O'Connell or Minshew, we know it's not going to be, you know, Brown, Anthony Brown, and it's not going to be, uh, you know, Carter Bradley, right? No disrespect to those two guys, but they're not competing to be starters. So uh, may the best man win between O'Connell and Minshew. For my money, I think O'Connell uh, is the is advantage O'Connell. He's the leader in the clubhouse. Next, you know, looking at the offensive side of things, where else is the competition? Right? The running back feels like it's pretty solidified. Right, Zamir White is going to be the lead back, I believe, with Alexander Madison as the as the you know complementary piece, uh, committee running back by committee. I think it's going to be the one-two punch of Zamir White and Alexander Madison. That's more of the role he played when he was in Minnesota and did really well. When Minnesota said you're the lead back, he didn't do it so well. So why try to have him do something that he didn't do so great? Get him back to his comfort zone. So I think that you'll see a nice little combination of Zamir White. You'll see Alexander Madison, and then you'll see Dylan Lobby, the six-round pick out of New Hampshire. You'll see him added to the mix as well, but he'll really butter his bread by way of special teams at least early on. So the running back position feels pretty solid. The offensive line I look at and say, okay, Colton Miller left tackle. I think Jackson Powers Johnson, as long as he's healthy, will be the left guard. Andre James is the center. The right guard is going to be Dylan Parham. And the right tackle, Thayer Mumford let us know that's his job. Right, and there's guys that can compete. And look, I don't want to make it sound like it's so simple, cut and dry, that these 90 guys aren't going to go to Costa Mesa and work their tail off. They are, because there's some guys that are going to say, yeah, I know Thayer Mumford's comfortable and believes that that's his right tackle spot, and the team is kind of sliding him in at that right tackle spot, but I'm going to show that I can be better. So, okay, Thayer Mumford versus maybe Dalton Wagner, right? I mean, I know that they went and got DJ Glaze. Uh, in the draft, but I think he's more of a kind of a swing tackle, uh, maybe even be a guy that kicks in the guard eventually. So I think it's kind of Thayer Mumford and maybe a question mark. But again, as I said, advantage O'Connell, advantage uh, Thayer Mumford as far as I'm concerned. Everyone else on offense, Devontae is solidified. Jacoby Myers is solidified. Uh, you know, Trey Tucker, I could say, is the third wide receiver. But, you know, Tashawn Reed brought up a good point uh, to me when he was a guest on my show on Monday is that, you know, Brock Bowers will probably serve as the third wide receiver, even though he's a tight end. Michael Mayer will be in the mix as much as well. So then Trey Tucker, I think just with his, you know, his his abilities, especially to stretch the field, that he'll be out there quite a bit. They, they you know, they could have a competition for that third wide receiver spot. When you look at Michael Gallup, who, you know, is not the Michael Gallup that really was wowing folks when he was in Dallas. He's a guy that his career has been derailed due to injury. But, you know, he'll have an opportunity to compete. Uh, you know, they brought in – uh uh, Guyton, he's got a guy. He's a guy that can stretch the field. Uh, he's been more of a journeyman. He was with the Chargers for a while, though. So you know, you kind of feel like maybe he'll go out there and compete. There's others like DJ Turner who probably be specialists on special teams as opposed to a real threat as a wide receiver. So I mean, I really look at the wide receivers pretty pretty solidified in their roles. Tight ends, we talked about Bowers and, and Mayer, and again, Bowers will probably play that slot role more times than not as far as a wide receiver goes. So the offense, I think, is, is really set, right? There's not really a whole lot of positions that are up for grabs as far as I'm concerned. Then you flip it over on the defensive side of things, I look at one spot, literally one, and that's the cornerback spot across from Jack Jones and Nate Hobbs. Nate's going to be in the slot. Jack Jones will be on one side. And there's one spot open, and that's either what, Brandon Faison or Ja'Korian Bennett. You know, that could be, you know, maybe MJ Devonshire, the seventh-round pick out of Pitt. Maybe he competes. Uh, maybe you look at... Uh, 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 DeCameron uh, Richardson, uh, DeCamp, maybe you look at him. He was a, a draft pick this past year as well out of Mississippi State. Maybe he's got an opportunity, but I look at those rookies as, yeah, you know, they'll, they'll go out there and they'll compete, but, you know, I don't really expect a whole lot from them year one. I'm expecting either J.B., Ja'Korian Bennett to step up and, and fill that void, or Brandon Faison, who was injured most of the year in 2023, to step up, have that physicality, have that size where he can compete and be that guy across from Jack Jones. I mean, let's make no mistake about it. The Raiders' approach at that position is that the defensive line is going to be so stinking good that the corners, I'm not going to say they don't matter, but they're going to benefit from that defensive line. Similar to what we saw from San Francisco for many years where that defensive line was so nasty, it made all the corners, no matter who they were, great. Right, And we've seen it many different times uh, with different teams. When the Eagles won their, their Super Bowl, right? they had what a front, a front line that was just nasty and their corners played well because, well, they didn't have any time that they really had to cover. Right? Like We know how the butter gets bred and how the Raiders are trying to get it done. So even though I think that's an important competition, I really think that that's the competition. Brandon Faison versus Ja'Korian Bennett. And that's all I see. Now, you might be able to see other 
camp position battles that I'm not looking at. But outside of the big elephant in the room, which is the quarterback position, which obviously is the most important position on the field, that's going to be a big uh, competition. I look at cornerback and maybe right tackle. I see three at the best as far as training camp battles going on. I think this Raiders team is pretty solid. And you know what? I like it. I like the roster. I really do. Again, we're going to have to see what it looks like when it comes to what the offense is going to look like with the quarterback in place, right? Can they get good to good to competent, you know, consistent quarterback play? They can win some games, but we know that they're going to try to butter their bread by way of the defense. We know that they're building a, def- a bully on that side of the ball, and that's cool, right? But the roster, I really like the weapons that they have offensively. Really like the weapons that they have offensively. Thought they think they could do some really good things if they can get clicking. And the defense, I mean, we don't really have to talk about that. We, we know what the defense should look like. They've got to go out there and put in the work. It's not just going to be handed to them. But we know the kind of physicality they're trying to bring to the table. We know the kind of, uh, you know, the, the kind of, like I said, bully that they're trying to build and what their expectations are for that side of the field. So, uh, you know, you, you let me know. You let me know if you see more – Position battles than the ones I'm looking at. Quarterback, cornerback, and maybe right tackle. Three at the most, as far as I'm concerned. Let me know your thoughts at 707-654-4693. That's the Lockdown Raider Podcast voicemail line. Your calls and texts are coming up next in segment number three of today's Lockdown Raiders Podcast. Before we get to that, though, I do want to tell you about the title sponsor of the show, which is FanDuel. I love sports. You love sports. I love them so much that I never want to see them stop. I really don't. The playoffs, they winded down. The finals winded, winded down. It came to a close. So we get fewer games, right? Baseball's out there. WNBA is going on right now. And there's not a whole lot outside of that. Of course, NBA free agency has been a lot of fun. But uh, the sports just aren't sporting like I really want them to do at this stage of the game. It really starts to slow down. But FanDuel lets me keep the sports going whenever I want. All I have to do is open up the app and dream up bets anytime that I'm in the mood. This summer, FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a boost or a bonus daily. That's right. There's something for everyone every day all summer long. Head over to FanDuel.com slash locked on. Start making the most out of your summer. FanDuel, the first official sports betting partner of Major League Baseball. Here we go, Raider Nation. Segment number three of today's Locked On Raiders podcast. Your calls and texts. Draft that Locked On Raider podcast voicemail line, 707-654-4693. No calls or texts on Monday's show, but we get back to them, and we get back to them right now. Let's start off with a call from Raider Ed in the 818. He's calling to respond to the podcast that I put out Monday that gave the really condensed story to my arrival, to how I ended up here at the Locked On Raider podcast, and also how I arrived here in Las Vegas. Here he is, Raider Ed in the 818. Hey, what's up, Q? This is Raider Ed on the 818. Just giving you a call, checking in as I do every few times a year. I wanted to actually call about the podcast you just, uh, just put out about how your Raider, being a Raider fan, helped you be where you're at now. You know, I think you missed kind of a point. Um, that's basically huge with that, uh, with the story you put out, I think one of the things that has made you so endearing to Raider fans and basically been the voice now of a lot of Raider fans is that when you came on the pod, you basically put it out there of what your goals and your objectives were, and you weren't afraid to say it. And you basically took us all along for the ride. And, man, that's been such an inspiration you would put it out there and say, you know, hey, you, you miss every shot you don't take, and I'm going to make this happen one way or another. Man, you were like 50, right? I'm going to get rich or die trying. Well, you were going to do what you're going to do or die trying, and that was such an inspiration. I think for a lot of us, we we were basically along for the ride and happy to see all your successes because we as Raider fans as well wanted more content, and you were the guy – pushing us in that direction. And we wanted to see uh, our own guy, our Raider guy, you, uh, make it happen. And it's been an inspiration, man. I, I hope that that's not lost on you, what you've accomplished uh, for other people as well. And it motivates me. Uh, man, I've been following along um, with you since you took over for Bill Williamson. And I think, like, uh, being along for this journey has been, uh, it's been a really cool ride to watch it. Uh, uh, watch it materialize and you manifest this thing. So I can just tell you that we're happy for you. We're proud of you. And uh, me as a 50-year-old dude, man, you've motivated me as well and inspired me every step of the way. So 
you keep doing what you're doing, man. You're doing a fantastic job, and I'm going to be around listening. I know a lot of Raider fans are going to be around listening. You're going to be around for a long, long time. So, you know, keep up the great work and uh, be excited to see what the next steps are going to be. Have a good one. Take care of yourself, Raider Nation. I'm out. Raider Ed, thanks so much for the call. I appreciate that. And I'm glad that the story – of and, and the journey that I've been on is, is motivational. And, and I've heard that before, and you're right. I did leave that part out. It was a condensed version of the story. As I mentioned on Monday, I could have probably told the story and, and, and gone a good 45 minutes, done three segments long, three segments strong, and maybe I should have. Uh, but I have heard that that, that is you know, a, a motivational story. It basically just lets it be known, and this is what my main goal is, is to let any, everyone know that I'm no way special, right? You just got to put in the work. If you want to put in the work, you can get where you want to go. And I'm glad the way that, you know, you brought it up about just setting your mind to doing something, not afraid to put it out there and go for it. Like, that's the main goal. People hit me up all the time. Q, I've been thinking about starting a podcast. I always tell them, do it. Do it. It's awesome, right? I mean, if, if you got something to say, you feel like you want to start a podcast, do it, right? Who's stopping you but you, right? And that's, that's my biggest thing. And so many people will tell me all the time, well, I want to do this, but I'm just not ready to start. Well, what are you, what are you waiting on? Right? <laughs> what are you waiting on? Just just do it. The only, the, the, like Antonio Pierce said when he became the head coach on November 1st, his worst day is going to be his first day. Guess what? The worst day here on the podcast for me was my first day. And I figured it out and continued to evolve as I went along, just like on radio. My first day was the worst day. And I continued to evolve over the years, over the years, over the years. And, you know, I made a pretty decent career out of it. And I hope it continues on for a long time. It's tough. It's a tough business, but I mean, if it was, wasn't tough, everybody would do it, right? So, uh, Raider Ed, thanks so much for that call, man. Really good stuff. I definitely appreciate you. Up next, got a text from Raider Nick out the 818. Says, yo, Q, it's Raider Nick out the 818. First of all, welcome back. I hope you enjoyed your vacation and our state. But listening to your newest podcast, I don't think we should be happy that the Raiders were the catalyst for our rivals to win a Super Bowl in our stadium and being able to celebrate in our locker rooms. That's Raider Nick out the 808. The 808 is Hawaii, where me and the wife just got back for from vacation. Raider Nick, thanks for the text. I do appreciate you. And I don't know if we're actually celebrating the Raiders being the catalyst to the Chiefs winning the Super Bowl. I'm more celebrating the fact that the Raiders got noticed. I'm more celebrating the fact that when Travis Kelsey was talking about the turning point in the season, you can hear the pain in his voice by having to admit it was the Raiders going into their stadium on Christmas morning and ruining their Christmas. Like that to me, you know, when, when people say, well, if my team can't be in the playoffs, at least let them be spoilers. I get it that the Chiefs go on to win the Super Bowl and they won it in Allegiant and celebrating. I get all that. But they spoiled what could have been another number one seed for the Chiefs and what could have allowed the Chiefs to stay home throughout the course of the playoffs. Now, it's not the Raiders' fault that Baltimore didn't handle their business or that Buffalo didn't handle their business. The Kansas City Chiefs had to travel to Buffalo and Baltimore, and they still got it done and finally won at Allegiant Stadium for the Super Bowl. So I understand where you're coming from, but my point of view was more of the Raiders and their approach and the way that Antonio Pierce had the team ready to roll was noticed and dreaded by the Chiefs, and they're acknowledging the style and the, the, the energy and anger that Antonio Pierce had the team playing with. And for anyone who didn't hear the show on Monday or hear what Travis Kelsey had to say on Bustin' with the Boys podcast with Will Compton and Taylor Lewan, here he is right here talking about what the turning point was of the 2023 season. Again, not celebrating them win a Super Bowl championship, you know, not, not celebrating that, but at the same time, just hearing Travis Kelsey have to admit that the Raiders punching them in the mouth is what made them – Turn the season around. Check it out. We yeah, got our ass change. beat by the f***ing Raiders on Christmas. The Raiders. F***ing ruined Christmas. God. Dude, Pace has got the... He had those dudes ready to ready to brawl mm -hmm. right there on the field. They are kind they of were taking old school Raiders mentality 100%, lately. man, and I love that mm -hmm. And I was like, man, if we play with that kind of edge or that kind of, like, toughness, that kind of, like, don't f*** with us mm -hmm. mentality, like we won't be stopped. Yeah. And it's just kind of, uh, it ended up like that. But that Raiders game was definitely one of the turning points for sure. So there was Travis Kelsey again on the Bustin' with the Boys podcast. And again, Raider Nick, I appreciate the text. I did appreciate Hawaii as well. Um, again, I'm not trying to celebrate the Chiefs winning a Super Bowl, but I am celebrating that the Raiders are getting acknowledged for the way that they're playing, the style that they're playing. And if the Chiefs are noticing it, Trust and believe the rest of the league is noticing the style as well. National media guys might not be talking about the Raiders, might not be giving them a chance, 
oh, they don't have this, they don't have the other, but they got something to get it done on the field, and it's being noticed by other teams. I think that that, that respect level goes a long way. Thanks so much for the text, my man. It's great to hear from you. Definitely appreciate you. Up next, Raider Eddie in Denver. He's calling. He wanted to respond to three items that he heard on Monday's podcast. Here he is, Raider Eddie in Denver. Hey, Q, what's up? This is Raider Eddie in Denver. Hey, hope you had a great vacation. I can't believe you only take one vacation a year. I think that with everything on your plate and uh, dealing with some of these people on Twitter, I mean, if you need to take two or three, Q, I do not blame you at all. But it's great to hear a brand-new podcast here on Monday morning. Want to weigh in real quick on three items that you've mentioned so far on today's podcast. One, uh, Antonio Pierce bringing up the level of the Raiders' play, nasty physical play, catching the Chiefs off guard, and they didn't lose another game after after we beat them. I'm curious to see what that's going to look like this season because I think every opponent that the Raiders face is going to say, look at the way this team played. Can we match their intensity? So I'm really, really interested to see what other teams do now that an AT Raiders team and our style has, has been on tape for a while now. Really interested to see what happens. I think a lot of NFL teams will try to match us uh, in that area, and I think some of them will be able to, uh, but then it just comes down to execution, of course. Second, um, I want to talk about uh, Wilson, Tyree Wilson, looking big. I, Q, just me, just my opinion, I don't really care if he looks big and giant. I'd rather see him look a little leaner and quicker. Um, I'm interested to see, is he going to be able to get off the line quickly? Is he going to be able to have some, some movement to get around the edge and uh, disrupt quarterbacks and get to the quarterback? I don't, I don't care about a Tyree that, 280 pounds, I would actually rather see a Tyree that's 265 leaner and quicker. That's just me. Uh, final, finally, Q, the, uh, the AP thing with the bankruptcy. I don't know how in the world that judgment is for 28 million. I, I don't know how, I don't think he put that much money in. I don't think he had that much money, but I, I guess I don't know, Q. I'm just surprised at, at the amount of the judgment. I don't know about you. I don't think it's going to be a big distraction, but it is at least somewhat of a distraction right now. I think winning is going to cure all. And to me, Q, AT is our, our new Madden. I don't care if that sounds like hyperbole right there, but to me, AT is the present-day John Madden for me because I see the way the players respond to him. If AT can win – if he can put the product out out there on the field that we all believe he will, and if he can help bring a home field advantage to Vegas, I think all of his financial stuff will work itself out. You know, Eddie, thanks for the call. Appreciate you as always. And, you know, again, kind of going back to what I was saying with Raider Nick, like I do believe AP style and approach the Raiders are taking is very noticeable, right? And that gets me fired up. I'm sure teams are going to try to match, as you said, you know, their physicality and, and they're nasty, but – are they going to have the team to do that? And what I mean by that, like every team could say that they're going to be physical, but look at the Dolphins. Like they're not a physical team. They're a finesse team, right? And, and look at the Chiefs and their offense. Like they're a high-flying, high-wire act. Last year, obviously, it wasn't the same, but for the longest, the Chiefs had a strike-at-any-time type offense. And teams, including the Raiders, tried to match that. Remember what John Gruden was trying to build? We went out and got Henry Ruggs, and he's bringing in these guys and, you know, has different players that he feels like can compete with that team and really go, you know, blow for blow, score for score. The Raiders just didn't have the dogs to compete. They just, they just didn't, right? So uh, any team could go out there and say, hey, we're going to go out there and punch the Raiders in the mouth and match their physicality and be just as physical. But unless that's actually who you are, that's really hard to do, right? It's not the easiest thing to do. I mean, you can say all you want to say, but – you know, everybody's not the bully. And if the Raiders, they go in there with the old school Raider approach to it and they are the bully, it's not easy to walk on the uh, on the bully's block and say you're going to take the bully down. It makes for a great Disney story, <laughs> right? It makes for a great after school special, but it's not something that everybody can do, right? So that's that's what excites me. You know, I, I again, I, I think that a lot of teams will try to do that and match that intensity with the Raiders when they play them. I just don't think a lot of teams really are built like that right now. 
Uh, as far as Tyree Wilson, he definitely has a lot to prove. Uh, you mentioned his size. And again, I, I mentioned that in segment number one, he really isn't as big as as it looked like in the pictures and videos that I saw originally. Again, I wasn't unfortunately able to be at that sack summit. But yeah, he has a lot to prove for every reason that you said. And his size, I'm not worried about it either. It was just what I noticed from the picture. So that's why I brought it to the table. Again, it's just a very small detail in a time where there's not a lot of details and a lot of information and stuff going on right now. And you mentioned AP and John Madden, and it's funny, when he took over, I said, well, the last time that a, a, a Raiders linebacker coach took over as a head coach, it worked out pretty well, and that was John Madden. Clearly, he's got a lot of work to do to be that guy. That's a Hall of Famer, right? So he's got a lot of work to do, but his style brings back the old school Raider feel to it. Uh, again, as you heard Travis Kelsey, Taylor Lewan, and uh, Will Compton talk about it from the Bustin' with the Boys podcast, and that's why Travis Kelsey said that that AP had them fired up and ready to roll. So uh, thanks for the call, Raider Eddie. Always appreciate hearing from you. Uh, we got one more a text from Ohio Raider in the 419. It says, Q, glad to hear you're back. Great story on your success. I'll be on the West Coast for a few days this week, so you know I got you locked in for the radio show. I've been a Raider fan since 1978, playing high school football as a sophomore quarterback. Our secondary thought of... Our secondary thought that the word, uh-oh, hold on. <laughs> uh, oh, okay, I got it. It was missing a letter. Our secondary thought they were George Atkinson at free safety, Willie Brown at cornerback, Neil Colsey at free safety, uh, Mike Davis at strong safety, Lester Hayes at cornerback, Charlie Phillips at strong safety, and Jack Tatum at free safety. I said, who are those guys? I was lighting them up. Uh, yeah, most of the time. Watched the Raider game. I've been a Raider fan since. Just win, baby. Ohio Raider from the 409. I get it now. I get it. It was a little bit, you know, confusion on the wordplay, but I get where you're going right there. The Raiders' uh, uh, secondary was was nasty when you were checking out the silver and black with Atkinson, Brown, Colsey, Davis, Hayes, Phillips, and Tatum. Yeah, that would definitely be a, a great secondary. And, you know, the Raiders are trying to build that. They don't have it this like that this year. It ain't got that kind of talent there. But they, they do have a nice little start when you know that they have a lot of Nate Hobbs. Uh, Jack Jones, he's got a lot at the cornerback position. Like what Merrick's doing, obviously, and like what Marcus Epps brought to the table, it's going to be for someone to step up and play that other cornerback role across from him. But uh, I do like what they're building. But it ain't those guys. Those guys are dudes, right? I mean, just absolute Dude, so uh, yeah, thanks so much for that. I do appreciate you, and I guess I got time for one more call. Sorry, Ari, if it goes a little bit long. Uh, Raider Meatloaf, he's calling to talk about what he's looking at, what success might look like to him, and the different elements that can come into play this upcoming season for the Silver and Black. Here he is, Raider Meatloaf. Hey, Q, it's uh, Raider Meatloaf here. Um, just wanted to uh, chime in and, um, you know, hope you enjoyed your vacation, so on and so forth, but I was kind of thinking to myself, first off, I'm really excited for uh, just to even see the uh, preseason football right around the corner, but uh, I can't wait for our season to start. But kind of what success for us this year is going to look like. Um, and I think that for me personally, if Gardner Minshew ends up finishing our season, the season, in my eyes, is we're in the same position, um, you know, that we were when we signed Jimmy G. Um, obviously, I think that we improved with the Christian Wilkins signing, the Brock Bauer signing. Um, but until we get a answer at quarterback, which we obviously won't have um, till probably halfway through the season, um, if Aiden, you know, is our guy, um, that's that's what success looks like for me because I personally think Aiden's going to start game one and he's going to finish the season. But if there's a chance that, you know, Gardner Minshew ends up finishing the season, to me, it's kind of a wash, you know, back to square one. But um really excited. I'm so excited to see what our team's going to do. I truly, truly feel like we have an opportunity to um take the AFC West. Uh, I think that we're bringing a whole new energy and what we showed on Christmas day, it's, uh, it's different. And I think that we're scary. And I think that, um, teams don't want to play us and, um, you know, we're coming, we're coming for you. So I'm right, man, take care. Me love. Thanks for the call. Appreciate you. O'Connell needs to show that he could be the guy, right? For all the reasons that you mentioned, if he isn't and Minshew finishes off the season, then, 
you're right. They're probably back in the same position because I feel like this team's going to win enough games, right? If the worst case scenario, they win enough games to be sitting right around where they were this past year in the draft, where they're too far away to get a top-notch quarterback, especially in a draft where there's not as many quarterbacks, at least not right now that we know of and we're looking at, uh, coming up in that, that could be potential franchise guys. Uh, you, want Min- you want Minshew to, to be there in case of emergency. You really want O'Connell to take that job, win that job, show he's the guy, and the Raiders go and win the 9 to 10 games that I believe that they're going to win, get a chance to get into the playoffs, and all bets are off after you get to the playoffs. That's the goal. Hopefully, O'Connell could do that. Uh, again, I said he's the leader in the clubhouse for the starting gig. That doesn't mean that he's going to be that guy. But ideally, in the best case scenario, O'Connell ends up proving he's the franchise quarterback and Minshew is just really good uh, you know, insurance. Worst case scenario, Minshew ends up playing a lot in the season. The Raiders are middle of the pack, and they're stuck wondering what the hell they're going to do to try to find their franchise quarterback again. they got to get a solution, a long-term solution to that position sooner rather than later. Raider Meatloaf, thanks so much for that call. I do appreciate you. Ohio Raider in the 419, Raider Eddie in Denver, Raider Nick out the 818, and Raider Ed in the 818. Thank you all for the feedback on today's show. We'll get back to more calls and texts. We'll have more news and notes. As I mentioned, AJ Perez, front office sports. He'll join my radio show at 2.30 this afternoon to talk about what's next for former head coach John Gruden and his lawsuit against the NFL, if it's actually going to be heard or not. You get something good from that, I can bring it to some news and notes. But we'll have plenty of conversation here, as we do on the daily, here on the Locked On Raiders podcast. So until tomorrow, Raider Nation, take care of yourself, take care of your family, love on your family. Most importantly, as always, just win, baby.